Hi, I'm Callista with Avalili Permaculture and the Earth Skills Institute, and this is my urban homestead located here in Invermere, British Columbia. And we are growing in a zone 3B, 4A, depending on which resource you're looking for or from. My personal experience is closer to the 3B. <laughs> So there are some little spots where we can grow things in, you know, more sheltered areas that are zoned for, but it does get cold. I'll usually grow cucumbers, peppers, tomatoes, eggplants, and then a variety of other things that I use for companion or like um, guild planting in here. So a lot of different kinds of beans and some of the herbs like basil that like it more hot in here. Yeah. In order to get the most um, out of hot crops in a cold climate, you really need a greenhouse or a space that's heated and that can extend your growing season. And I did forget to mention too, maybe we should go back with the uses bit because I also use it for um, for season extension and, and starting my cold crops really early. Uh, initially, the greenhouse that I had in this space was actually had a, a slightly larger footprint than this one, and the bed layout was different. And actually, with the layout that I've chosen in here for the beds, I actually have more square footage of growing space than I had previously, and it's much easier to manage. Hmm. Um, and the the inspiration for uh, the actual cross um, section shape here that we have, uh, which is like a double shed roof is um, there were a couple of needs that I needed to meet um, and being in an urban space there are some some challenges so I needed height but not too much height um, to go past the limits of the bylaws here in town for like a secondary building um, and also we still wanted to have a view of coming out the window here of sort of the mountains in the background so I didn't want this to be too tall to block that out um, and then the roof angle, you still want to have like a decent amount of angle on there for snow shed and also to get the most um, solar gain coming in. So in order to kind of meet all of those those requirements, um, we chose to do this double double shed roof, which works pretty good. And then this nice little pony wall you have at the top is great for throwing in some ventilation. So it's wonderful. For me, this having the timber frame has been a worthwhile expense, mostly because we had all of this timber we didn't have to buy it it was all kind of scrap stuff that had been accumulated from other projects um, and there was at one point a lift that we had bought like a long time ago that was super cheap it was just trying to clear it out um, and we have all the had all the tools and the know-how to build this now if you were somebody who didn't have those things it's definitely more expensive um, it might it may not balance out for you um, but the, the other reason why we wanted to go this route and build a really sturdy frame is because we wanted it to last a long time. And the way that this greenhouse is built is basically in a manner that if we wanted to convert it into a year round uh, passive solar greenhouse, it's roughed in to do that. So we could just insulate the back walls here, the side walls, and put, um, you know, like a polycarbonate on the on the front here and it would be essentially ready to go as a as a passive solar greenhouse that would grow annually yeah. uh, originally i talked about um i had a different greenhouse here so um design it smart um some of some of the big insights that i've learned from like the bed design for example is in the initial one that i had i had just two beds one was against the back wall, it was three feet wide, which if you can only access a bed from one side, that's too wide. It was too hard for me to reach the back without like stepping in the middle of the bed, crunching plants, it wasn't ideal. So if you can only access a bed in a greenhouse from one side, I would say make sure you make it um, like arm's length width because you don't want it to be so far that you're having troubles to reach the back. If you can reach it from two sides, you can make it like twice an arm's length. But for me, so I would say like two feet maximum, one and a half feet to two feet maximum for one, access to one side. If you've got access to two sides, I would say three to three and a half feet is ideal. Some other insights is the path width. When I first designed my other greenhouse, I made the path super wide because I was like, oh, I'm going to need to get in there with a wheelbarrow and like tools and like buckets. So I want those pathways to be wide enough to get a wheelbarrow in there. 
Do you know how many times I went in the greenhouse with a wheelbarrow? Once to put the dirt in the beds. <laughs> <laughs> so your path does not need to be that wide. I think this one is 18 inches or 20 inches wide. Like it doesn't need to be that wide. The best way to figure out what's a good width for you, um, which is what I did for this one, is to take what you would normally be carrying in your greenhouse, if it's a bucket or just some hand tools, and just set up a couple of boxes in your living room that are different widths apart and just walk through there with your bucket or whatever and see what's comfortable if you're doing raised beds, right? So that's what I did. That's how I came up with the width for these paths. I'm like, oh, well, if I'm just using a bucket and a hand trowel, like I don't need to, I don't need a huge three foot pipe pathway to get in there. Um, and then raised beds are brilliant. Uh, the biggest insight and the reason why I, I highly recommend doing raised beds is because your plants are up above where all of the cold is going to sit, cold air is going to sit in your pathway because cold air sinks. So you've got a raised bed, your plants are just up a little bit higher out of that layer of cold air on the bottom, you can extend your season even that much more farther. Um, so raised beds are awesome. Also super ergonomic, like oh, so, <laughs> so easy to just sit there and garden, right? Um, so there's that. And then ventilation, holy cow, you cannot ventilate enough. The number one reason I have um, people asking me about what's wrong with my greenhouse, I can't grow things, or it's too hot, it's, it's just, it's ventilation. So there's no such thing as overventilating a greenhouse ever. There's always the number one problem is under ventilation. So make sure you can open a lot. So on my greenhouse, this whole front wall, this whole front vertical wall opens up and then the, all the whole um, pony wall on the top opens up. So <clears throat> cross ventilation is super good. Have one on the bottom, one on the top or on the sides, just so that there's airflow that can go in and cool air can come in the bottom, hot air can go at the top. That's number one thing. Um, and it makes a huge difference in what you can grow and how things, how well things grow, how healthy your plants are, um, being able to regulate the temperature appropriately. Because when it gets too hot, everything just doesn't like that, doesn't do well. It causes a lot of problems with disease or stunting of growth or weird things. So wilting of plants, they get very unhappy. Any other big insights? I guess the other one too, the original greenhouse we had, had a completely different cross-section shape. It was very similar to uh, Groundswell Network Society community greenhouse over there where it had a vertical back and then like an arched front like this. And if you're going to do that, it's a fine design, but just if you're going to do that, you have to make sure that you have a very steep slope on the front. Um, the one that we had um, was sort of more like less steep less like this and more like this and there was too much snow that would sit on the top and it ended up collapsing in on us so mm. um, just keep in mind about your snow loads and your roof slope is all I have to say there that's really important especially if you're um, building um, one that's a little less sturdy doesn't have like timber framing but maybe is um, something similar to what we had initially which was uh, sort of a, a framed in back wall a wood framed in back wall with um, rebar and pex piping on the front to give it that curve and then we had this same mesh on there metal mesh on there too but it's it's not as sturdy the rebar bends so you have to make sure you got good roof angles if you're gonna go that route yeah biggest challenges well right now as you can see the darn raspberries that's a big challenge uh, some of the other challenges that I've had in the past are, are pests. Like when you first build a greenhouse, there's like this two, maybe three years tops of like this little sweet spot where you don't really have any problems, but then after that they start showing up. Um, so learning how to manage that um, has been a bit of a challenge because it's different every year. Um, so one of the challenges that, uh, or some of the challenges that I've had in previous years are like different types of tomato blights or like powdery mildew on my... Um, uh, my cucumbers or um, mites which are notorious on your eggplants oh my mm. gosh such a pain so I've, I'm learning and I've been observing and learning 
when to start treating for those things or when to order ladybugs, when to order, you know, mighty mites to combat those things because the timing is really key. I've ordered ladybugs too early and then they're all there, but there's no, there's not enough aphids for, for, for them to eat for any length of time. And so then they go away and then I have a huge explosion of aphids later. So getting the timing right has been something that I've been trying to hone in on over the years of doing this and then making sure that there's really good pruning on my tomatoes and good aeration so that, uh, you know, there's good airflow that reduces the amount of disease like immensely. Um, and then, uh, one of the other things, it's not a challenge, but just another thing that I've learned um, is with the guild planting and the companion planting, it makes a huge difference when you do that versus just, oh, this is my tomato bed, right? And it looks a little bit gnarly because there's a lot of stuff growing in the bed, but it actually improves um, pest, like pest management, it improves the flavor of a lot of things, mm. and um, and the production levels, like, holy man, you throw some hot, hot beans in there that like hot weather in between your tomatoes and your peppers and they grow like a lot better than they do otherwise. Usually with my tomatoes I'll plant like tomatoes along here because they get the most height here to grow and they will grow all the way up to the ceiling and be stuck on the roof. <laughs> and then I'll grow peppers in there too and those are you know all of your hot crops are heavy feeders so they need a lot of nutrients so I always add compost and um, the things that I like to plant with the tomatoes is basil, um, Sometimes I'll throw oregano in there too, but basil is a good one. It's a strong aromatic herb. It's really good for um, pest management. And then it also improves the flavor of your tomatoes. So funny how basil, when you cook it with tomatoes, is like so delicious, but also growing them together is a wonderful combination too. So, and then beans. Um, bush beans are actually prefer hot, hot weather. So they do really well in a greenhouse. And you know, it's there's this funny thing that happens when you grow bush beans outside they only get, you know, so big, like it's a little bush, but you grow them in a greenhouse and all of a sudden they're like giant beans. So just be prepared for that. Um, but they, you know, the beans are a nitrogen fixer, so they help provide extra, extra nitrogen for those heavy feeding crops, which is, you know, your peppers and your, your tomatoes. Even the cucumbers, I'll grow, I'll grow different kinds of beans and the cucumbers that like to trellis up the side too. So you can use a runner bean, but they don't they don't do as well in hot runner beans actually like it or cool beans like it a little bit cooler. So I like to grow those yard long beans, the big long ones, and they hang down with the cucumbers. It looks really cool. Uh, yeah. So beans or peas in the early season. Peas don't do well when it gets hot though. They like cooler weather weather. So um, you know, in the springtime I like to just grow a bunch of greens in here. And I'll grow, you know, different kinds of lettuce, kale, um, which, you know, my baby kale, I'll harvest baby kale, but then also I'll take them outside and transplant them for later in the, in the outside garden too. And spinach, you know, shard, same thing. I can transplant shard out too and use it for babies in here in the springtime. And peas, like I'll just throw random peas in because that, again, just helps for replenish the, the nutrients in the soil and the nitrogen in the soil. So. Hmm. Now that I have a greenhouse, I cannot imagine living with that one. Uh. No way! Um, I think it's just brilliant. Like even if all you had was a greenhouse space versus an outdoor garden space, it would still be worth it to have that. Um, even more so than having the outdoor space because you can extend your season that much farther and just grow that many more things. So for me, I, I seed the greenhouse in like the end of March, whereas outside I won't seed my cold crops until like end of April, early May. So I'm getting almost four weeks on the spring and then probably about three weeks on the fall. So I would say I'm getting about six weeks in total, six, six to seven weeks in total of added growing time, which, you know, when you're growing uh, greens or cold crops, radishes, you know, spinach, that kind of thing. It doesn't, like the turnover time is not that long. I have enough time to grow that stuff um, to the point of harvesting it and then plant my, my hot crops in here without having any like extended cold crop time in here, you know what I mean? <laughs> so usually I'll have my cold crops in and then they're out by like the second week in May and my hot crops are in here by the second week in May where, or, or even the first week in May, depending on how the weather is going. Um, so you know, outside I wouldn't be able to plant plant hot crops or anything that was like frost sensitive until like the third week in May. May long weekend is kind of our, that's our, our time where we're like, okay, it's safe to plant stuff outside now. 
you can push it if you have like frost coverings and stuff, but that's just too much of a pain for me. <laughs> so yeah. That's... Hey guys, Callista here with Avalili Permaculture and the Earth Skills Institute. Today I'm going to give you a little tour of my annual garden. So the first thing I'm going to point out here is that we have this huge spiral pathway system. It's also a swale system. So I actually collect rainwater off of my roof and run it through some pipes underneath the ground here. You can see the top of this one. This is socked as you go down and it actually has holes perforated all the way through the whole pipe. So um, the rainwater I collect off my roof goes into this swale system through these pipes and actually waters, it's a deep watering system from the ground up. And it also duels as a pathway. You can see I've got it lined with these lovely coffee bags, which is a free local resource for me um, with Kicking Horse Coffee here locally. And they're totally um, organic and biodegradable. They break down, I have to replace them every year. They make excellent compost when I'm done with them. And they just help keep the bark mulch that I have underneath there clean of any dirt so that my bark mulch lasts a little bit longer. And this space I use uh, for all of my annual crops. So I'll plant everything in here beets, carrots, onions, garlic, leeks, uh, beans. You can still see some kale and chard and cabbage and broccoli, cauliflower, um, and then some greens as well. Um, and then in this space right here, I have a raised wicking bed. And the reason why I decided to put a raised wicking bed here is because this is along the south side of my house. It gets really hot in this site and this bed would always dry out. So I decided to make it into a raised wicking bed, which means that there's actually a little reservoir of water that's held in the bottom of this bed. It's lined with plastic in the bottom there so it holds a bit of water so this bed doesn't dry out as quickly. And then there's this nice trellis that I use to grow you know, squash and things up against the side of my house, which actually is great because it provides a bit of shade on that south side of my house, helps keep it a little bit cooler. And so we water this through again using that little perforated weeping tile. You just water that in there and it goes down into the bottom of the bed and fills up about the bottom quarter of the bed with water that just kind of stays in there. Over here I have some perennial herbs there's lavender. This is a nice little hot spot here against the south side of my house with these rocks so I can get away with growing things that are a little bit more borderline. There's a yucca, there's some bee balm and wild bergamot, oregano, some strawberries, some chives. This is fennel, it's a little bit crazy. Some echinacea. And then I have a whole bunch of succulents in the rocks around my pond here, which is getting a little overgrown. So this little pond is, yet again, another little water storage mechanism for me. Because it sits out, um, and it becomes a nice source of non-treated water for me to use in my compost and things like that and for watering. You can see there's a stand pipe in the middle here, which this fall now I'm going to drain this pond out so it doesn't freeze. I just push that stand pipe down and this actually empties out into my swale system as well. So again, more water going in there. And then along this side of the garden here, we have another little perennial section here. So there's some goji berries, there's currant, there's sorrel, there's a bunch of other herbs and strawberries there. And um, along the back side there, there's a couple of plum trees. Um, one's a toka plum, and I don't remember what the other variety is. I've forgotten now. It has big red plums on it. They're really good. Um, and then this is another raised sort of wicking bed as well, except this one is built more like a raised hugel bed. So it's loaded with a bunch of woody debris, and I actually use this one to grow some perennials. So I have some blueberries that are in here that you can see they're kind of going to sleep for the winter now, but um, they like this space. It's good conditions for them. And yeah, so that's kind of how I, how I run through my, my annual garden there. It's, uh, it's pretty awesome. The, the way that I like to grow things in there, in those, the, the beds create a lot of edge being in those sort of spiral shape like that. So I like to utilize all of those little 
microclimates that I get having that shape. So on like the south side of those beds, I'll grow things that like it hot, like beans. And then on the north side, I'll grow things that like it more moist and cool, like onions. In the middle, I'll grow my bigger things like uh, carrots or beets, that kind of stuff. So I would absolutely recommend using a soil system in an annual garden. Uh, it really helps reduce the amount of watering that you need to do later in the season. It's also a really good way to just keep that resource on site. Like instead of watching that rainwater flush off the street and take a bunch of who knows what off the road with it into a local stream or river and just seeing that resource being essentially wasted. I mean, it's not wasted, it still goes back into the system, but it's lost to you, right? That's a resource that you could keep on site. I would highly recommend using a swale system. Yeah, it's a bit of work to install and it does require a bit of maintenance. You have to change the mulch every once in a while, but um, it's a really effective way to uh, reduce the amount of stormwater runoff in, in your community just in general by keeping it on site. It helps reduce the amount of watering that you need to do, especially in an urban site where you might be reliant on treated city water. It's much better for the microbes in your soil. They're not getting chlorinated and getting killed. So overall, it's just really good for the health of your garden and just for the larger ecosystem as a whole. So what am I most proud of? Geez, it's a really tough question to answer because every year I feel like I nail something different um, and try to focus on something different every year um, because I, I I'm just one person and I have two kids to manage and, and a lot of other things going on. So it's hard for me to keep tabs on everything all of the time and do everything perfectly. So every year I try to focus on one thing and make it kind of my goal to really hone in on that one thing. Um, so every year it kind of varies. Um, you know, one year I'll be like really, really keen on making sure my compost is like on par, right? And like going to get that hot compost pile done. So I have done that and I've been super proud of it. This year, that wasn't my strong point. I didn't focus on that. This year, my annual garden did pretty good. I probably could have weeded it one more time and it would have done a little bit better. Um, my greenhouse kind of got away on me with those darn raspberries this year. And the food forest is like the grapes are just rocking it this year. There's so many grapes. Um, and so, I mean, and, and that's all fine and dandy. The food forest is good, but there is a bit of grass going, growing in there, which I really need to get on that. So that's my big, that's my going to be my focal point for next year is to really get that, that open space where I lost that shrub, get that fixed up. Um, but I think what I've done the most, that's been my, my strong point this year that I've been like, yes is that I have two hives of bees that are, have been really successful up there this year. And I've been really good at doing a lot of internal permaculture this year, which is a whole nother, um, whole nother landscape to talk about. So yes, the homesteading, you know, there's all this stuff that happens outside, but realistically, if you're not in, a, in the right space to be able to manage everything personally, it's not gonna matter how much you get done out here it's still not going to feel good. So for me being in like a really good emotional space has been my big thing that I've been really proud of this year. Hey guys, Callista with Avalili Permaculture and the Earth Skills here again. Thanks so much for watching and checking out my place. Uh, thanks to Verge Permaculture for featuring me. And if you want to see more about what I do, you can check out my YouTube channel as well um, or find me on social media. Again, Avalili Permaculture and the Earth Skills Institute. Thanks guys. Thank you.